realized we had a good idea, but we had no money. So we sort of had to reach out to our friends. And this is just a shout out to uh, the Fiscoliosi family based on their confidence in us and a little pipe dream actually gave us the initial seed money to start this, uh, this gate lab and this venture. So we just wanted to thank them. Um, and we got a great program for you tonight. Dr. Lieberman, I think wants to say a quick hello and then we'll, we'll get going. Izzy. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. It uh, is a privilege and an honor to be able to present uh, in front of this audience. And I would like to thank our partners, uh, Dr. Ziegler and Dr. Geyer for the help in establishing the gate lab. It, as always was a team approach. Uh, Ram Hadass, the director of our gate lab has done a great job in promoting it and getting things going over the last six years now. It's amazing it's already six years. And with that, I'll hand over to Ram to uh, chair this session. Thank you, Ram, and thank you everybody for joining us. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Lehman. Uh, so welcome everybody, uh, good evening. Uh, the topic of today will be the utilities of functional analysis in patients affiliated with spinal disorder. The, the first speaker will be Dr. Alex uh, Sadin, who will discuss about the practice gap and what do radiographic telling us and what is not telling us. Alex. Perfect, uh, thank you and uh, good evening everybody. Um, thank you to SSF for hosting us. So uh, my goal tonight is to share some of the ways that uh, dynamic functional analysis enriches our understanding of uh, both spinal disorders and treatments. So uh, traditionally, uh, spine patients have been evaluated by two primary methods, uh, static imaging and patient reported outcome measures. Um, the radiographic assessments are useful in defining deformity and determining if alignment goals were achieved after surgical correction. Uh, however, they do not provide information on functionality. And then furthermore, such uh, methods are a bit limited uh, in disorders where radiographic alignment goals are less defined or relevant to the ultimate surgical outcome. So an example of that is uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy. Um, these patients typically exhibit a slow progressive stepwise decline in their function and difficulties with bait, gait and balance are uh, common and, and described, but um, functional analysis in these patients allows us to expand our understanding by characterizing their uh, spinal and lower extremity kinematics and spatiotemporal gait and balance dysfunction. So uh, you can assess these metrics for changes following surgical de decompression and it provides a surgeon with objective, irrefutable evidence for functional improvement that is not always necessarily captured radiographically. Uh, so at most centers, radiographic assessment remains the uh, only evaluation tool to assess uh, alignment and spinal balance. And this is typically done by full length standing EOS radiographs. And through these radiographs, you can perform local, regional and global measurements that allows for quantification of these different pathologies. Um, so a lot of great work has been done in defining normal spine parameters, and correlating these abnormal states with health related quality of life. Um, but in the end of the day, these are just static two dimensional pictures. Um, so they're a bit limited in its ability to assess functionality, certainly, as well as the three dimensional dynamic changes that constantly occur with motion. In recent years, the concept of dynamic sagittal imbalance has been described in study. And, and uh, this refers to the worsening of spinal balance that occurs following the gradual exhaustion of compensatory mechanisms. And uh, the dynamic process kind of underscores the limits of conventional radiographs in assessing patients. And while some authors have looked at this after a, um, a 10 minute uh, walking test, more recent work has focused on defining dynamic ranges of spinal alignment during gait um, and using three-dimensional motion tracking. So in a recent study done at the TBI gate lab, dynamic alignment was evaluated by linking radiographic alignment to kinematic alignment during standing and gait. <clears throat> so these images show the determination of the dynamic sagittal vertical axis um, for an adult spinal deformity patient. So a unique consideration that uh, kind of came out of this study uh, speaks to how the dynamic alignment measures relate to 
radiographic based deformity classification. So this is the uh, SRS Schwab classification. Um, it does a good job of, you know, separating deformity patients based on the severity. Um, and that's all based on standing radiographic alignment. Um, in, a re in this recent TBI study, the dynamic sagittal vertical axis measures indicated that patients that were deemed mild actually transitioned out in and out of the moderate modifier range for global alignment over the course of the gait cycle, whereas the severe patients remained constantly within the moderate or marked ranges. And uh, similar findings were found for the pelvic tilt, uh, the dynamic pelvic tilt. So while these dynamic alignment measures will not supersede these classifications and standard uh, radiographs, you know, awareness of the relative amount of transitioning between static uh, thresholds may be helpful with decision making um, for preoperative planning with borderline deformities for patients with unique functional uh, demands in life. So uh, the last thing we'll talk about are um, compensatory mechanisms. So prior studies have used the uh, these static EOS films to study um, compensatory mechanisms uh, with sagittal malalignment and spinal pelvic mismatch. Um, and while they can help define the mechanisms utilized to maintain erect posture and horizontal gaze, um, they do not provide information on dynamic motion and the compensatory strategy, strategy utilized by patients um, after they encounter maximal displacement in all three planes. So um, expanding on prior work that quantified the cone of economy through three-dimensional video kinematics and EMG data, um, we evaluated the motor control strategies utilized by adult deformity patients to maintain balance. So um, briefly get into this a little bit, but briefly we looked at the peak sway points and calculated um, range of motion for each joint at baseline. And then at the peak, and then return to baseline in the sagittal and coronal planes. Um, and then we were able to use this data to categorize the patients based on a balanced control strategy. And um, without getting into that too much, um, we were able to define the mechanisms um, by which the deformity patients corrected themselves. And uh, that hip strategy was the one that was predominant. So we have a, a video here. So deformity patients in the study demonstrated increased motion in the trunk, hip, and knees. Um, and to stay inside the cone of economy. And they relied on a hip balance control strategy, which you can see in the video here. So unlike previous attempts, um, this described the techniques, um, the dynamic techniques and measurements to define what is actually occurring within the cone of economy and uh, define a unique control strategy for each patient. So um, finally, we'll conclude with uh, some future directions um, you know, it may hold a promise as a, a new realm or consideration in the preoperative planning when defining a, uh, you know, patient's unique, um, you know, cone of economy and measurements and how they function within that. Um, and then the concept of ideal standing alignment um, continues to be refined. Um, and we can hopefully define the um, alignment that will provide the greatest functional gain, which really is the ultimate goal of surgical correction. And then perhaps it might even help us understand the um, dynamic component that contributes to things like adjacent segment degeneration and hopefully reduce it. So thank you for this opportunity. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, great job. Next, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Damon Marr. Damon is a postdoc research fellow in our lab and doing an amazing job with us. And he will talk about uh, tools in function analysis. Damon. Everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to go back a slide. I'm not seeing the controls on my screen now. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm not able to advance or move the slides. Click the right hand button, right hand arrow. Yeah, I'm not seeing the arrows, unfortunately. Uh, Just click on your screen. Yeah, I did click on it earlier. Maybe try it again. They're there for like a second and then they go away. Apologize for the delay here. It's working, Damon. I'm not seeing the arrows though, so I can't. Forward and back arrow keys, Dr. Mar. 
go. Uh, okay, that'll work. All right, sorry for that. So the title of my talk is Hollywood, Bathroom Scales and Drones, Almost, uh, Tools and Functional Analysis. So my goal tonight is just to give everyone kind of an overview of the equipment that we use in our lab and kind of get everybody on the same page with the uh, terminology. So we're talking about objective function here. So I'm um, talking about physical function and ability of our patients to perform daily tasks of, um, in life, like lifting, sitting, walking. Um, and we like to point out that we're talking about measures that should be thought of independently of patient reported measures of function, like the ODI, for example. Um, and these can also be thought of as extensions of neurologic exams. So things like rather than a qualitative assessment of a, a subject's gait, um, we can actually quantify how much they're moving their knee, how much they're, they're moving up and down. Uh, and the way that we do this with, is a, with a set of pretty sophisticated tools um, and kind of going with the analogy of my title, uh, Hollywood gets us our motion tracking, uh, bathroom scales gets us the concept of force plates and pressure mats. And drones kind of covers the concept of what we do with uh, service EMD, uh, service EMD and IMU sensors. I'm just going to kind of go over the basics of each of these and some pros and cons. So first stop, Hollywood, talking about motion tracking. Uh, when we talk about motion, we're thinking of kinematics. So we're tracking uh, anatomical landmarks on the body using a set of markers, uh, like what you're seeing in the picture on the left. Um, we apply them uh, key points that give us body segments so we can measure every limb, the trunk, the torso, the neck, et cetera. And we track them with an array of cameras uh, arranged in the room. And there's a variety of tracking technologies. We use a passive system that kind of gives us a, a perfect balance of uh, reasonable accuracy and relative uh, ease of use uh, given the number of patients that we see on a daily basis. So uh, the way that we use it primarily with the kinematic measures is we use a full body set of markers to get joint and segment range of motion measures. So looking at how much somebody bends their knee or how much they lean forward. And when we apply this uh, to spine patients, we can look at things like right and left symmetries, which is relevant for scoliosis patients or patients with unilateral pain. Um, spatial temporal parameters is a fancy way of saying spacing and timing. Uh, so these are measures primarily related to the gait cycle. We can get distances such as step length um, and then timing such as walking speed or duration, so support times of one leg versus the other. Uh, kind of key advantages of a motion tracking system is that it's really the most comprehensive motion analysis tool that exists right now. Um, it provides a, a very good accuracy and precision, especially for the purposes of tracking human motion. And it's a well-validated and well-studied tool um, within SPINE, both by our own institution and others around the world. Um, Disadvantages of the system, it really represents the highest amount of cost of a typical evaluation lab like ours. Um, it's a highly complex system, has quite a bit of setup time um, and daily preparation to use it. And it can have a limited adaptability. It's typically set up one way and it's generally not changed. So we have our motion. Now our next set of data is our forces. And this is where bathroom scales come in. So. Uh, we often describe to our patients that uh, to have them think about our force plates as three-dimensional bathroom scales. So we get forces and moments in three directions from them, and these allow us to get, in turn get ground reaction forces. And uh, pressure mats are another type of force sensor that's similar to a force plate, but rather than just being a single sensor, it's an array of very small, simple sensors in a grid and allows us to get measures like center of pressure, contact area, and force distributions. And this is particularly important for symmetries, uh, for something like a bench we're seeing here in the bottom left and the profile of somebody sitting on it. So with these devices, uh, we get kinetics or force measures. And like I mentioned, ground reaction forces, looking at a person's uh, transferring of their weight onto their foot and then off of it during the gait cycle or shifting their weight from one side to the other as they lift. Um, those are all things we can do with this. Uh, we also can estimate joint reaction forces if we combine it with our kinematic data. So we're looking at the resulting forces in the ankle, knees, and hips. Uh, and then with our uh, forts and, or sorry, with our pressure mats, we can look at forts and contact areas. And this is relevant to study patients uh, shifting their weight, rising from a chair, for example, or shifting their weight uh, when sitting for long periods of time. And again, spatial temporal parameters can be uh, estimated from uh, these as well. Uh, key advantages of these is that they're really the most precise and accurate measures of force uh, that can be used in a clinical setting. They're relatively easy to use, um, pretty simple outputs. Uh, and then with multiple devices, there's a fair amount of configurability in terms of having uh, data for multiple steps during gait or having independent measures of right and left legs during uh, standing tests. Uh, disadvantages that they're still relatively expensive um, and they can have limited 
adaptability again. Um, typically they're installed in a single location and not changed. Uh, but pressure mats can have some ability to be uh, reconfigured. We've got motion forces, and now our final one's kind of our effort uh, measure. And this is where EMG and IMUs come in. So surface EMG, I think a lot of uh, you are familiar with EMG, uh, looking at muscle activation. We use uh, surface dynamic uh, EMG that gives us dynamic muscle activity for whatever task we're measuring. Uh, inertial measurement units, or IMUs, may be a little less familiar. They kind of come from the aviation field. It's what helps us balance and fly our drones. Um, but in the context of what we do, I like to have people think about them as a three-dimensional goniometer. So it's simply giving you angles in three directions, um, all relative to one. And if you have multiple sensors, then you can get position estimates based on a calibration pose. So in our lab, we do a fair amount of work with EMG, um, simply looking at muscle magnitude outputs in terms of effort. Uh, when we look at multiple sensors in conjunction with each other, we can get measures of neuromuscular coordination, such as during a lifting task here. Um, and again, we can stratify between right and left sides and look at symmetry. Uh, additionally, with IMU sensor data, we can get additional kinematic position data. And this is really important because this can be independent of the motion tracking system. So this means that we can take a lot of these measures out into the real world and outside of the lab. Um, and again, spatial temporal parameters um, can be derived from these through pattern recognition. And this is how we're getting your, uh, your footstep count from your smartphone, or your smartwatch, or other biometric data. Um, Main advantages of these are obviously their flexibility and use. They can be applied anywhere you want, depending on your research needs. They're relatively low cost, um, highly configurable. They can have as little or as much data as you want. Uh, weaknesses is that there's still a fair amount of setup time involved with them. They have to be placed and configured. And the data can be quite complex as the large number of sensors means it's a really large number of data as well. So uh, just to kind of keep things short, I'm kind of going to gloss over these last two slides, um, but just to point out that there's a lot of considerations when you take all these pieces of equipment as a whole, when you think about the lab, for things like resources in terms of computing, upkeep and costs, uh, space is everything, um, proximity to the clinic and accessibility for patients is really important. And obviously there's a pretty unique background requirements for staffing. And uh, as I think you'll hear a lot more in the, the rest of the session, there's a, major considerations for clinical integration and physician involvement to make sure that the data that we generate is both useful um, for, the, for our clinicians and ultimately for improving patient outcomes and treatments. Uh, thanks. Great, thank you very much, Damon. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Peter Derman. Um, he will talk about the correlation of functional analysis parameters and outcome uh, questionnaires. Great, thank you. Let me share my screen here. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, great. So as Ron mentioned, we're gonna transition here. I'm gonna talk about the relationship between patient, report, patient reported outcome measures and the functional analysis parameters that we are measuring in our lab. Maybe. There we go. So here's a, just a smattering of the traditional PROMS, patient remote reported outcome measures. Um, they, they're categorized into a couple of different groups. There's generic measures of quality of life, like the SF36 and the EQ5D. Then there's some spine specific measures that I'm sure everyone's familiar with, ODI, Roland Morris, VAS or NRS scores that are, are pretty pervasive. And then there's some spine specific uh, instruments for fear avoidance. So Tampa scale and then the FABQ. There's also the promise, which is getting a lot of um, press more recently. And, and basically it, it becomes an alphabet soup of patient recorded outcome measures, you know, which to measure, which at what time points and, and really what do they mean? There's some literature looking into this actually. Um, this was a systematic review of what patient reported outcome measures were reported after spine surgery, lumbar spine surgery. Most common, which are the ones that we see a lot, obviously, ODI, SF36, and, and the ones listed here. However, these are used because they've always been used without really a lot of evidence regarding their sensitivity and specificity. And in fact, in their conclusion of this article, the authors called for a fundamental reappraisal of these instruments. And, you know, even without a systematic review, I think we can all, all the clinicians certainly can see why in, in practice, some of these have limitations. And so I just wanted to go through some of this. So, you know, we've all seen this patient, um, he comes in, 
doc, I need surgery. I can't live like this any longer. And then you look at his VAS scores and, and they're zero all the way down the line. And, and it's hard to kind of rectify those two things. And, and part of it might be, you know, this patient filled this form out when he's sitting in the, in the waiting room and he's got no pain when he sits. And then he stands up and he's in 10 out of 10 pain. And it's a little bit unclear how they should be filling these forms out. Um, and, and that's not really captured in a lot of the patient reported outcome measures. Here's another one, completely comfortable looking patient sending text messages um, in your clinic and it's 10 out of 10 all the way down. And, and like what gives, it doesn't always correlate with what you're, um, what you're seeing in your office. Or this one, doc, it's absurd how much paperwork you make me fill out. I'm just not doing it. And this is a big problem when we start doing research. There's a lot of null values because either people didn't understand the question or they just have survey fatigue, which is a real thing. Or this one, doc, I filled out the form for my grandma because she forgot her reading glasses. And, and this happens. Patients are either, you know, not facile with using the tablets or, you know, have difficulty with visual impairments or whatever reason, can't fill it out themselves. And suddenly it's somebody else interpreting uh, for them. And then thank you so much since surgery, I'm finally able to exercise again. You're like high five in yourself and you look at your pre and post-op scores and they're exactly the same. Um, and, and what you want is like, you know, great improvement. Clearly the patient is better, but that's not reflected in the patient reported outcome measures. And so obviously, you know, this, this talk is about functional analysis. And I think that functional analysis gives us the ability to objectively look at how patients are doing both before surgery and, and after surgery um, so that we can use that in conjunction with the kind of more subjective patient reported outcome measures. Um, Damon gave a great talk going through all of the various elements of the functional analysis that we measure at our lab. Here's some of the kind of output that, that we get. This is a patient with cervical myelopathy um, trying to ambulate, clearly unstable there. And then um, she had a decompression infusion and, and clearly walks a lot better. And, you know, this generates like reams and reams of data that only Dr. Hadas and Dr. Mar understand. And they distill it down for uh, those clinicians out there and, and, and we help interpret it for them. Um, but you can clearly see that, that this woman is a lot better and we're able to objectively measure that now. Here's another thing we look at, at balance. This is a uh, cone of economy. Um, this is measured with the human um, motion capture, but also uh, with a GoPro that can be put on the patient's head and, and watch and measure their sway. So what's the relationship between patient reported outcome measures and our, our functional analysis? There is some data on this. Um, I wanna go through, go through it. We'll keep it kind of at a high level rather than get in the weeds. Um, this is a systematic review of studies looking at ODI and comparing that to walking measures. Um, there were 10 studies included. They did find some correlations uh, with walking tests in the office, although they tried with accelerometers and, and were not able to find that. So something, right? It's not perfect, but there's some correlation. Um, here's a um, paper looking at 25 patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, and they looked at PROMS and functional assessment and compared any correlations. And they found some various things. Basically, ODI was the most closely associated with objective functional analysis measures. Um, SF12 had some pain scores. Um, oh, wait, excuse me. SF12 was not significantly correlated. Pain scores had some correlation. But ODI was the most closely associated, but it was not as sensitive, as you might imagine, as functional analysis. Here's some of our data out of our gate lab, looking at um, over 350 patients with a variety of pathologies. What we were able to find was that um, there were some, uh, some correlations between ODI and a variety of the functional measures that we measure. However, the functional analysis seemed to be more sensitive. It could differentiate between the different pathologies and the different diagnoses, whereas ODI was not able to do that. Here's a, another paper, 26 patients. They compared functional assessment to PROMS. Um, this was a really interesting one. So they looked before and after surgery. And so before surgery, they found that the patient reported outcome measures didn't correlate with very many of the functional analyses. However, after surgery, there was more of a correlation. And, and I think that this might be 
because initially the lack of association might be, have been done, might have been due to pain and the psychological distress associated with that. And so, you know, the subjective assessment of, of someone's function is certainly colored by the amount of pain that they're having. Whereas afterwards, ostensibly, they were less in pain and, and more objective with their assessment of themselves. And that kind of brings us to kind of the psychological, psychosocial aspect of pain and function. And so we're, fun we're fortunate at TBI to have Dr. Block, who's a psychologist who um, does a lot of publications with us. And, and we've been comparing kind of these psychological um, patient reported outcome measures um, with the, our functional analyses. And, and what we found is that there are some correlations there. They're not perfect, but um, you know, fear avoidance um, does correlate strongly with gait, gait parameters um, in a variety of different patients. Both these patients were uh, scoliosis patients and we've looked at um, um, cervical myelopathy as well. So in conclusion, you know, I don't think there's one right thing, like we should only be doing PROMS or we should only be doing functional analysis. Clearly, there are, there's a place and there's benefits for both of them. So patient reported outcome measures, um, they're less expensive, they're easy to administer relative to creating a gate lab. However, as we mentioned, they're subjective and they're, they're not as sensitive as functional analyses. Whereas functional analyses, on the other hand, um, they're, they're quite objective, they're very sensitive. However, the flip side of sensitive is it can be like information overload. And, and literally there's, there's hundreds and hundreds and probably thousands of data points generated for every patient. And it does require people with specialized expertise in order to wade through that and, and generate output that's clinically meaningful. And then as I mentioned, gate labs expensive and not necessarily widely available. Hopefully that will change with time. And so again, I think that both of these things are, are really important. We need the subjective assessment of the patient and how they're doing, because ultimately that's obviously important, what matters, how they feel they are doing, but also what matters as we're assessing how we are doing as surgeons is how they're functionally and, and objectively performing after surgery. So in conclusion, both provide value. Um, if you don't have a, a, a big expensive gate lab in your, in your clinic, you can still do walking tests. So get up and go and, and timed gate studies that don't require anything except for a stopwatch on your phone. Um, however, I think that technologic improvements will make more advanced measures uh, more widely available. As we talked about pressure mats, you can now get for $1,000 there's even, you know, force plates that are like three grand at this point. So certainly not inexpensive, but certainly not six figures. And, and some of these things are portable as well. And so that's, that's my, uh, my talk here on outcome measures and quantitative, qualitative, quantitative analysis. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, great talk. Uh, before moving forward, we would like to do a little uh, pause and answer uh, your questions. So if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat and uh, we will answer them. Ram, there, there was a question about whether or not you can get reimbursed in the pediatric world for the gate analysis. Yeah, I'll let, uh, easy, you wanna answer or take this yeah. one? Yeah. So there are CPT codes to get reimbursement for gate analysis, but it is restricted to cerebral palsy evaluations in the pediatric population. Uh, the insurers are not recognizing gate analysis as a uh, provided service in the adult population right now. Uh, it's a bit of an issue. I think it's a shortcoming. But uh, as Peter pointed out, uh, there is a lot more technology that's coming down the road that's going to make the gate analysis that much more convenient. Uh, there are a number of companies that are now developing uh, foot plates, uh, shoe beds, essentially, that you put in that can monitor your gait and help with rehab. There's companies that have apps for your iPhone, and you can strap your iPhone to your chest or your back, and you can get a lot of similar measures. And there are even uh, specialty-specific uh, gait analysis type, uh, what they call IMUs, um, inertial measurement units, that can do all that. So we're going to see a change over the next one to two years. Uh, I don't know where the insurers are going to go with it, but I think it's going to be um, it's going to be a much more important tool for all of us as a truly objective uh, measure. 
There was another question uh, here. It says wearables like watches, the Apple Watch will be able to replace the Gate Lab. Uh, I don't know that it's going to replace it, but it's certainly going to uh, add to what we can do more efficiently and more conveniently. Then um, Sig Bourbon asked, uh, what's the anchor metric when studying the utility of data from gate analysis compared with PROMS? Uh, I Sig, I think if I'm reading your question correctly, and maybe unmute your spine, but uh, the anchor metric can be variable. We, we've got multiple different anchor metrics that we've been looking at. Uh, including uh, the balance metric, including the gait, step, stride length, uh, compared to fear avoidance. Is, is that what you were referring to? It, it really uh, is. Yeah, was, uh, I thought uh, all these talks were terrific. I was referring to Peter's talk. Peter, um, when you're talking about the accuracy of, of um, either gait compared to an ODI, for example, you showed some the relatively low correlation between the SF36 and the gait information and the ODI. Um, but what do you really use as an anchor in terms of the patient's experience of their function? It's hard because, you know, there's, there's no gold standard prom out there. Um, and so what we've been doing is we collect all of these things and, and we've been reporting on the associations. I think it, it depends largely on the population and what you're studying. You know, ODI was developed for back pain patients, um, not necessarily radiculopathy or a lot of these other, uh, these other issues. And so, um, you know, in the absence of a gold standard, we're just kind of using the most common ones and reporting the associations. So I can uh, jump in and add something. So we're actively looking into this. Um, you know, the notion of the minimum clinically important difference for patient reported outcome measures is well established in the spine community for a lot of these metrics. And our question, you know, initially was, well, should, would these be considered reasonable anchors for our functional measures as well? And this is ongoing work of ours currently that we don't have anything to share, but our initial feelings are that this may not be related. And if you look at what Dr. German is presenting, it's exactly pointing that there may not be reasonable substitutes. And honestly, it's a chicken and egg situation where the, the, the patient reported measure may not be hitting on the underlying condition of function, whereas ours may be something completely different. So it's something that we're actively seeking you know, our own MCIDs for these, as well as looking at the relation to other measures that are currently existing. And I think it might be useful to even develop some patient-specific metrics. So, um, and one of the things we've been working on uh, here at UCSF is the idea of having uh, patient-specific goals for surgery, uh, because uh, the ODI is a functional metric or the SRS instrument or SM36, you know, none of these are, are there terribly specific. So what about using it as an anchor? How, how well are you walking? Or how is your, how is your gait? And, and using maybe that as something that might be a little bit more, uh, have a little more utility or uh, a little more specificity than the ODI, for example. Definitely. Yeah, those are, those are all valid, valid comments. And again, we're dealing right now, we've been gaining experience across multiple populations of patients, just trying to learn what the data means. Uh, we're now at the stage where we have to become much more specific with the data and, and look precisely at the goals and the outcomes and decide what to do. And the rationale is future learning with this. Uh, this can help determine what we're gonna do with patients in the future. Which patients are we going to operate on or potentially not operate on when we see these functional results? Uh, one of the things that uh, I learned over the last couple of years with the Gate Lab is the delta of improvement in the various different degenerative pathologies that we, we've uh, evaluated. If you look at our cervical spinal or the cervical spondylotic patients, uh, they look like they improve substantially, but we're missing a huge group of patients because we see a lot of cervical myelopathy patients that can't walk, that we cannot test ahead of time. And we have no way of measuring that improvement on them. Uh, likewise, we see a lot of very functional patients uh, that improve dramatically in terms of their pain and their perceived function, but their measured function seems to be static. And I, I'm gonna show a couple cases uh, where we see differences in all of this. Um, someone asked about how soon after cervical myelopathy surgery should we see change in, in gait of patients. Uh, we're measuring our patients uh, before surgery and at 
three months, six months, and a year after for most of the studies. Uh, by three months, we've seen a lot of very dramatic changes in the, the cervical myelopathy patient. But again, I think we're short selling ourselves because we're not getting the, the truly, uh, the patients that truly can't walk at the beginning uh, and, and measuring those ones. Any other comments from, from any of the other uh, panelists or members? Okay. Uh, let's move on. The next presenter is uh, easy. Lieberman, he'll talk about uh, the use of functionalities uh, as part of his clinic. So uh, working with Rum and with Damon and, and the rest of the team there is, has really intrigued me in, in terms of the function of our patients and, and what we can do. And I've been trying to really correlate to myself, why is this important? What, what can we do with this? And we all know that in spine surgery, we struggle to get the, the best outcome, but we're not always effective in, in improving the patient's pain, uh, in improving their function, even when we have that perfect x-ray. And we're all essentially laying right under the sword of Damocles. Um, we're, we're damned if you do, and we're, we're damned if you don't. But the information we're getting now is, is going to help us get out from underneath that and, and going to show us what we can and can't do. So this is a, a case, and this is sort of a typical case, 70-year young male, back pain, a bilateral leg pain. His complaint is he can't walk. You can see he's already had a 4-5 fusion. Uh, here you can see his MRI scan. You can see he's got multiple other levels uh, that are stenotic. And I went ahead and uh, instrument, decompressed him and instrumented him up. And this is at six months, his, his x-rays. And here's his gait analysis. So this is him walking before surgery. And he's telling us he can't walk, but he's, he's measuring pretty well. And here he is at three months post-surgery, much more upright, much smoother gait, narrow base. And when we look at the results, we can see his walking speed has improved, his stride time has improved, his step time has improved. Essentially across the board, we have substantial improvements in his functional outcome measures. And we also look at the posture and balance measure. And this was him on the left pre-op. You can see this is looking from the head down and the blue circle here represents the total sway. And you can see by three months, he's already normalized. He's balanced himself. He's got a little bit sway forward and back, but he doesn't have the coronal side to side sway just standing there. So this does justify our existence. This does tell us that we are doing better for these patients. And then you marry that with his patient reported outcomes and you can see his visual analog score. And these were the 1.3 uh, year scores that he came back with. Pre-op back pain eight, leg pain eight, post uh, one and a half, 1.3 years later, he's zero and zero. And his ODI also improved substantially from 54 to 14. So in my mind, this, this just helps me justify that I'm doing the right thing for these patients. And, and that's how I'm using it in one instance. Another way that we've used this to, to justify what we do is post-operative rehab and giving the patients uh, exercise programs. And one of the things that I have been uh, very uh, committed to is the use of walking sticks as opposed to a walker. But everyone kept asking me, well, prove that the walking sticks are better for the patients. You know, they show that it really makes a difference in the patients. So we did this gait analysis looking at the difference between walking sticks and a walker. And we know that with the walking sticks, you're upright. With the walker, you're sort of kyphotic. And as you look through it, I think you, there we go. Uh, so you can see on top, one of our patients walking much better upright. The second one with the walking, with the walker sort of chasing herself. We took 20 patients. We did the gait analysis a week before surgery and uh, after surgery again under three conditions with the walking sticks, with the walker, and then without any device. And essentially what we found was that 
with the walker, they were walking faster. Uh, with the walker, their cadence was faster and their step time was faster. And I kind of thought, wow, that's, that's not what I was hoping to see because the walking sticks were slower. But if you think about it and analyze it, what we're doing is because the patients are pitched forward, they're chasing the walker and they're sort of racing against the walker instead of walking in a nice, normal, upright cadence. So we are able to show that the walking sticks do help patients stand upright, keep them going. It makes them look up at the ceiling as opposed to down at their feet when they're doing it. And we saw that there were improvements in the sagittal and kinematic parameters, although they were walking slower with the walking sticks. And then with the training, uh, we see the spatiotemporal parameters did improve over time for those patients. So again, using gait analysis to justify our patient interventions. And then this is the last case that I wanted to, to show. And this is a 56 year young female, uh, low back pain, right lower extremity radiculopathy, numbness, degenerative scoli, MVA. She went through all the various different treatment options, really did not help her substantially. And we also sent her to see Dr. Block, our clinical psychologist. And these were some of the conclusions that he came up with in the pre-op psych eval. Um, believes that she cannot be helped. She tends to brood and ruminate about her problems. The MMPI showed elevated sensitivity to pain and feelings of helplessness. The psych issues though he felt were not that intense that surgery should be avoided, but he felt that we should continue psych evaluations on an ongoing basis. And he said that her feelings, uh, she cannot be helped would predict poor self-reported outcome measures. So this was prior to surgery. We went through with her, this was my preoperative plan to correct the degenerative scoli. And it was sort of a staged approach, anterior body fusions, posterior instrumentation. Here she is intra-op, and here are her pre-op and her one-year post-op films. Got her aligned, looks real good. I'm really proud of what we've done. And she comes back to me at one year and look at her patient reported outcome scores. Pain scales substantially still elevated pre-op uh, to post-op at one year. Her ODI is essentially the same thing, 58 pre-op to post-op at one year. And I'm thinking, should I have really even operated on this, this late at this point? Yeah, I made great x-rays, but is she really feeling any better? Here's her pre-op gait analysis. And you can see how she's walking a little bit pitched forward. Here she is post-op, clearly standing taller, standing straighter. And as we go through her gait analysis, dramatic increases in her cadence at one year, uh, dramatic increases in walking speed, stride time, step time. We see increases in all the various parameters that we went through with her, despite the fact that she perceives that her outcome was not as good as she wanted. And the fact that Dr. Block predicted she wouldn't be happy with the outcome ahead of time. So this is something where I will show this to the patient. I'll say, you know, you are actually doing pretty well. Look at how we've measured this. And the patients actually really do like seeing their videos and that little colorful stick man of them, them walking and the difference. And maybe we can change their mindset by showing them some of this stuff as well. So Peter had outlined some of this, that contemporary research protocols we're looking at. ODI, VAS, the SF36, the generic health questionnaires, but are they really the right things to be looking at? I do feel that the work that is being done now with functional analysis may become one of the most reliable and objective measures for those with spinal disorders. Uh, I've said a couple times now, you really can't fake gait analysis. If you try to fake it, Rum and Damon can actually pick that up with the measurements that, that they're looking at. And I think using gait analysis and, and looking at our patients and trying to correlate with all the other objective and subjective measures are just gonna help us do a lot better for our, our patients in the future and eventually gonna give us more information about what those goals are 
as Sig brought up, what the goal for the patient is going to be down the road. So how has it helped me? Well, it has helped me in the recognition of other musculoskeletal pathology. I've had patients come through with hip issues, spine issues, knee issues, and we can tell which one of those issues is giving them the most limitation in their gait. And I've had numbers of patients who have gone for a hip replacement and haven't had to come back for anything for the spine now. It is going to help us dictate treatment options. It's going to help us support the treatment options. It's going to give us the most objective measure of the outcome. It's going to provide our patients with objective feedback. But probably most important, it's justifying my existence as a surgeon. I, I can now objectively prove that I'm helping these patients. So with that, thank you. And I'll hand it back over to Ram. Okay, thank you, uh, Music, Great talk. I'm going to share my screen really quick. Good. So I'm just going to finish uh, a great session that how we can actually make it part of the standard care. Now I'll present Texas Beck Lab as an um, as example. So the lab is actually, sorry, the lab is actually uh, established in 2015 and include a multidisciplinary team of clinician and investigator to study spine patients' function and the effect of surgery on their function. The lab is located at the, at the heart of our plano clinic and including human motion capture, EMG, and force plates like um, uh, Damon presented. The lab is dedicated to improve care uh, for those patients uh, performing clinical research and educating spine care, uh, spine care provider. Here's a list of the personnel that required to run uh, a lab like we have. But I, I would like to point to the last point, which is the most crucial component of the, of the lab to be successful. You need to have a uh, strong and reliable physician referral, uh, referrals that work with you and send you patients constantly. So at the beginning, we start with, um, with Lieberman and Dr. Block that you can see, and then slowly we got more and more project and we got more and more physician join our mission. And then we got some PM&R and, and neurosurgeon uh, adding us, and then we end up with a strong team of physician that's referring and using the lab as a tool uh, to help and dedicate our function. So the primary goal of the lab is first is provide functional outcome measurements and we'll discuss about it in a few minutes. Then we also providing some clinical reports that actually go, are going and uploaded to the patient chart. On top of that, we're using data for research and education uh, purposes. But it's have to be a consistent communication of, of metrics between uh, the researchers, the clinician, and the patients to be able um, to have a successful lab. So here is some example of, of tests that we're doing in the lab. So the first step, and you saw a couple of these videos already, is walking. We're taking every patient, we test the walking before surgery and after surgery, and we're measuring a lot of cool stuff. Then we're looking at the balance in various uh, ways. So Alex uh, Satin he just presented before, we actually quantified their kind of economy and we're looking on their compensation and how this, compensa how this patient compensating uh, getting back to the, uh, the central or the balance. They can use the hip strategy <clears throat> or the ankle strategy. <clears throat> Thereon, we correlate, <clears throat> we correlate their kind of economy with their EOS and radiographic measurements and then we compare it before and after surgery. Then for cervical malopathy patients and, um, and more dynamic patients, uh, we're doing a tandem gait, as you can see in the top videos. Uh, this is really for all, uh, cervical patients. And for our functional patients and more young patients, we do the Y balance test, which is basically standing on one leg and try to reach as far as you, as you can and kind of try to challenge them with the balance. Couple more testing, we start analyzing the lifting style for our patients uh, before and after surgery. And we're looking on ground action force and actually applying a similar and symmetrical pressure on each leg. And if they're using more the hip and the knees and the trunk whenever it's lifting. Same pattern, we're looking on how patients are moving from seat to stand and how much pressure they actually apply on the butt cheeks whenever they're sitting. If this uh, pressure is symmetrical or they're referring uh, one side compared to the other. Then uh, we're just testing our patients while they're sitting. So we have them sit for a full minute of this pressure mat. And this is this example, you can clearly see that these patients are laying more, relying more on the left side and try to stay uh, away from the painful side, which is the right leg. Then we're plotting uh, the head motion for the top view that you can see over here. 
and we can see how much the patients are swaying while they're sitting, and then we can, can, can compare it to a healthy control. Uh, recently, uh, we started studying some ergonomic stuff, like you know how your phone affecting the neck stress uh, and how working from home uh, affecting all the neck stress and biomechanics. And for those functional patients and the younger patients, that their goal is just get back to play golf, we're doing more performance uh, testing here in the lab. So I'm going to present a quick example of cervical myelopathy patients uh, that, that we had. And again, I'm not a surgeon, so I'll do my best to present it. Uh, this is a 63 years old female lady that's actually involved in a car accident. And she is, uh, was ejected from the car and have a severe concussion. Her main complaint was uh, neck and back pain, upper extremity weakness and constant numbness and heaviness in the fingers. And she also complained of limited neck range of motion. Uh, her gait uh, is myelopathic and spastic, and she was unable to complete the tandem gait in the, uh, in, uh, in the clinic. So here, how she look, uh, here's some x-rays uh, that one of the physicians took, and here's the MRI. You can see uh, stenosis in C5, uh, 5, 6, and 6, 6, 6, 6, 7. And here's how she's walking. So on the left video, you see how she's walking, and on the right, you see her trying to perform a tandem gait. And this is um, about a week before her surgery. Surgery performed was ACDF from C5 to C7. If you look on her uh, prompts, the VAS significantly reduced after six weeks, same thing with the NDI, similar, similar results. But if you look in on, on her function and the way she walks, so you see her video on the left, represent her walking before surgery. The middle one show her walking three months after surgery and 12 months, she's, she's a happy camper, basically. She got back teaching to school, she's almost uh, normal. Now look at the differences in the tandem gait, uh, pre-surgical on the left and three months after surgery. So one of the questions was how, how far are they getting, uh, they're feeling better? Three months, we start seeing significant difference, but they're not quite uh, there. So usually about a year, we start doing a good results. So what we're doing with all the school videos. So one thing we are generating is actually a clinical report that go into the patient's chart and we try to make it uh, as easy and, re and readable for the patients to read. So first we're, po we're reporting the prompts that related to their functions. And we have the pre-surgical uh, data over here, post three, one year after and now uh, two years after. And here we kind of uh, color code it to see if it's good or bad. Uh, then we're providing a highlights of all the gait uh, parameters. And again, values for the pre-surgical, short-term, long-term. And then here we also compare into a healthy control and then color coded if it's actually good and bad. Uh, we're also providing some um, uh, graphic uh, measurements. So the same graph about the walking speed, step length, and then range of motion basically. And the gray brand in the background represent a healthy control plus or minus one starting deviation. So basically, if your patients end up within the band, uh, they perform like a healthy control. Uh, we also have a portion on the, uh, the, the report of the balance, basically, when they're looking at the size of the cone of economy and how much they're swaying before and after surgery and compare it to healthy controls. So you can see in the gray column. And, and here we can see a top view of how much this patient swaying before surgery, short term and long term after surgery. So the timing of testing, usually we're testing our patients uh, about a week before surgery, short-term follow-up, depending on the surgery, can be two weeks, uh, up to three months. And then we have several long-term follow-up, can be six months, one year, or, or two years, basically. The time of the testing, uh, the testing take between 20 to uh, minutes to an hour, depending on the number of tests we're doing and the, depending on the pathology and the cohorts they are associated with. After the patient's leaving the lab, it's take us uh, 30 minutes to so about an hour to process the data and get everything ready uh, to upload to our database. If it's the uh, kinematic, the kinetic, uh, the EMG, the pressure met, and the other variables we're doing. And then to generate a report, it's taking about 15 uh, to 13 minutes uh, as well. So how much is it actually cost to uh, have this lab? So you need to have a big chunk at the beginning to buy all this equipment that Damon uh, presented. And you can go as fancy as you want, basically. Then you have to hire personnel or a team of personnel to run the lab. And then you have expected to have uh, ongoing supplies. 
So beside the fact that this is a very powerful and objective tool to quantify patient fu uh, functions, are physicians also learning about the degree of disability of the, pa of the patients, especially before the surgery. They're learning about the effect of surgery on function and how they actually justify it and helping these patients. Uh, we're developing a new metric for quality of life. I mean, you see how this patient lifting, how they're walking, how they're sitting, uh, this is all represent the quality of life. And then we improve the details uh, for rate and degree of post-op recovery. Then our recommendation for uh, building a successful, successful gate lab is to have a strong team of clinicians that dedicate and constantly refer patients to the lab and have a quality group of expertise that run the lab uh, behind the scene. So in the futures, uh, you will see more and more functional testing. You saw some of them today, we'll probably see them out, uh, out um, in the journals pretty, uh, pretty soon. Uh, like one of the question was about the verbal device. I'm suspecting that we will see more and more verbal device basically, which allow us to collect similar data, not all the data, but we can get a good grab of it. And, and the most important thing, we can collect data of patients outside the lab. And then uh, the last thing, we are working behind the scene with other institutes and also in TBI uh, to try to standardize the functional outcome measurements and make sure we all standardize and can develop a multi-center uh, study and compare our patients um, between clinics. Uh, that's about it. I'd like to thank to all the speakers and SSF for the opportunity to present our work. Awesome. Thank you, Dave, uh, Damon. Thank you, Rum. Thank you uh, to Peter Derman and Alex Satin for, for joining us on this. Uh, any other comments from any of the other panelists? We do have a couple more minutes. Any other questions? Uh, someone else um, asked in the chat discussion, does insurance pay for it? And again, insurance does not uh, cover the gait analysis, unfortunately. Uh, it will cover gait analysis in cerebral palsy children, but that's that's really it right now. So we've got some work to do on that. Have you ever thought about pitching it to, say, workers' comp or insurance? To It sounds like you feel like you can pick out those sandbagging patients. Is there a, a thought of pitching it to them? Because they, they would pay for it. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Heise, you just volunteered to be our TBI liaison for the Gate Lab to Workers' Comp. Nice. And, and to attorneys, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> In it. I'm on it. Izzy, Izzy, so how do you get, you know, this is Neil, how do you get your patients to the Gate Lab? I mean, do you get resistance that they need to go to the Gate Lab? I mean, just walk us through that. How, how do you convince them? It's actually been very easy. Um, I described to them what the Gate Lab's about. I explained to them that the Gate Lab is going to help me assess their function before and after surgery. I tell them it is going to take some time. It, it's, it's an hour, hour and a half of, of your time, but it's going to help us help you. And quite frankly, uh, Rum, Damon, and the team there entertain the patient. <laughs> They, they enjoy it. They have a good time with it. Right. But what does it gate. cost the patient, though? Nothing. We're not charging. Oh, okay, great. We don't charge the patients anything. The Gate Lab is, oh, that's great. is a TBI expense right now. Uh, we've got some studies that are funded. Uh, we've got some uh, investigator-initiated studies, and we've got some industry studies that are funded that we're using in the Gate Lab right now. Uh, but by and large, it's, it's a service that we're providing to help us pay help us better take care of the patients. Well, fantastic work, Izzy. Keep it up. Fantastic. Thank Good you. Stuff. Well, One thing I'd like to, to take the opportunity, just since you uh, let us sneak in the room, um, coming from the perspective of the lab, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to share our work with you on this platform. And what we really need from the spine community right now is as much feedback as possible. So these questions are awesome. Um, please ask us at conferences when you see us presenting. Um, or in settings like this, because that's really what helps us help you um, in the long run is because this is a new frontier for a lot of this technology. And so we're, we're working as we go, um, but we greatly appreciate it, so. Awesome. All hey, right, great job, guys. Terrific, terrific work. I wonder if we just, uh, as if you bring up one more question, you said one of the biggest effect sizes you're seeing is a reduction in the cone of economy of the area, or presumably the volume of the cone of economy. And, you're seeing that after deformity corrections, presumably. Are you able to correlate that at all with um, uh, with, with, with uh, mobility, uh, the ability of patients to to, uh, to touch their toes or to um, 
I try their shoes. Uh, is, is there anything that you're looking at there in terms of some of the impairments that might be associated with a long fusion? Damon, why don't you take that one on? Sure. So that's absolutely a direction we're heading. Uh, so the, the study that Dr. Satin mentioned about the dynamic alignment, um, the next logical step uh, that we want to include is, you know, evaluation of flexibility and its relation to what we see kinematically, because in theory, if the patient's more flexible, we should be able to see that. Um, and that's just simply a matter of sample size for us. So we're, we're adding patients day by day. Um, so unfortunately, we weren't at that point when we did the initial study, but that's absolutely, there's no reason why we can't measure that. So on the books to to be done. And also for the non-deformity folks out there, we're, we are using the, the lab to look at kind of bread and butter, um, you know, microdiscectomy, those kind of things to, to really establish objectively when we can have return to activity, return to sport and, and things like that. So this is definitely applicable to really any spinal pathology. I think uh, it's worth noting with the panelists included here that, you know, total disc replacement should be considered right in there as well in terms of what kind of effects we might expect to see. Awesome. All great comments. Great work. Very exciting time. This is going to help justify our existence and do better for our patients. Uh, thank you all. Have a great night and uh, we'll see you Friday morning, I guess, at our next round. Enjoy. Be safe. Thank you, Izzy and team. Thank you, Seattle Science Foundation. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Good night, guys. Great job. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.